Yesterday, Jane said to me, you know that you're going to be doing a wrap-up at the end of this, don't you? Uh, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> so I've been taking notes, and so partly I will be uh, a bit incoherent. Uh, but actually, a lot of what Roy said in his last talk, I think, touches on many of the things that have come up today. So for just random thoughts, basically, to send back to you to think about as you leave. Uh, first of all, in a general sense, we've pretty much ignored contemporary technology. I don't mean stage technology. I mean, from the time of ancient Greece, when they started flying, you know, flying machines, theater has always been interested in, in mechanical technology for the stage. But I mean, the world we grew up in. Um, Every generation is different. I talked about how you know, reality, you know, how do we see reality. Uh, my assumption is that most of you, the students who are here, grew up with computers. I didn't. Um, and uh, my parents' generation grew up with radio, not television. Uh, the way computers work affect the way we think. So if we think about you know, how the leap from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance in terms of how to depict reality, uh, it's a change in the structure of the mind, I think. And that has happened, it has happened uh, in our society. Uh, so I think you know, it's not a question of, oh, we'll put, a, we'll put a mobile phone on the stage or a computer on the stage, and that makes it modern. But no, how is the mind structured, and how is that effect affecting? how we are responding to what is on the stage. Uh, related to that, we haven't talked much about sound. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the evocative quality of music. Uh, so Roy played a theme song from a television show. It meant nothing to me, because I didn't grow up in this country, and I'm a bit older. Uh, but there are, of course, an equivalent range of television shows that I grew up with. I was, I was basically born with the first commercial television programs. I was plunked down in front of the TV as well to keep me entertained. But my whole generation and subsequent generations grew up. And yes, you hear a particular theme song, and it evokes a time, a memory, uh, where you were, what you were doing. Uh, the equivalent thing happens with pop music. Uh, I don't know if it is still true because we have sort of access to music wherever and whenever we want, uh, but you know, certain songs take you back to your teenage years, or certain songs take you back to a particular lover, or certain songs maybe evoke a food. Mm -hmm. um, but this is part of sonography as well. Uh, so how is the sound of a performance going to affect how the audience receives it. Uh, and it may be, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be music. It can be some other kind of score. If I can go back to Chekhov for a moment. As I said, he was furious with Stanislavski for creating, among other things, these sound scores of crickets and horse feet clomping uh, and the night watchman's cane and all of those sorts of things that Stanislavski put into it. And Chekhov, writing, I, I think, to his wife, said, I'm going to write a play. And in it, somebody is going to say, listen how quiet it is. There are no crickets. There are no birds. Um, but obviously, the well-chosen sound score affects the way that we respond as well. Um, Roy raised an interesting question that, again, is something that we touched on maybe indirectly today. Uh, but this question, where is the audience? Uh, and maybe even starting before that, as you did, uh, how are you entering the theater? Uh, where are you coming from? Now, obviously, the theater can't predict where you're going to come from or control that. But it can create an experience the moment you walk through the doors. Uh, is that necessary? Uh, does it do something? What happens when you go to an elaborate uh, early 20th century or 19th or even 18th century theater with elaborate uh, designs of you know, Rococo, whatever, uh, and we feel like maybe we're in a cathedral or something like that as opposed to a black box theater. By the way, I hate black box theaters. They should be abolished. Uh, 
white box theaters maybe, uh, but because black box theaters is just so depressing. Um, but so what is the process of entering the theater, which is visual, but it's also a feeling of space? What is the feeling of the audience in the space? And then what is the arrangement of the audience? It's not that theater in the round or thrust theater uh, or proscenium theater, any of those things are better or worse than any other and are appropriate or not for a particular play. Certain plays can work under any circumstances. But again, it's a sense of knowing what that space is and knowing where the audience is going to be and how they respond to it. Uh, one of the obvious things in theater history is that many of the great periods of dramatic literature, ancient Greece, Shakespeare, all of them, Moliere, they knew the theater they were writing for, which was largely a theater that was an architectural space, not a, not a cinegraphic one of, in, in that sense, not a decorative one. But they knew the theater, they also knew the actors they were writing for, and that affected what they wrote. Um, the idea of recognizing the world, which is something I raised in my uh, opening talk, uh, that the audience has to recognize the world in order to respond to it. Uh, in some cases, it can be quite literal. You seeing, seeing yourself on the stage or seeing an environment that you recognize. Uh, oftentimes, it doesn't have to be that specific. But what is it about the performance that makes it feel like, yes, I recognize that, or I feel that that is a possible world? There are any number of ways that that can happen. But if that doesn't happen, then we can't get into the play at all. And we go out thinking, oh, that wasn't very interesting, or whatever we might think. Um, Last thing I want to mention, because we have a very short amount of time, it's just sort of a personal experience that has to do with a coup de théâtre, uh, not unlike the one that you were talking about. Um, in my talk this morning, I talked about uh, the play The Octoroon by Dion Busico, which had a camera as the key plot point. Uh, it's a play that I've taught in classes, but it's a problematic play. It was written just on the cusp of the Civil War in the United States. Uh, it takes place on a plantation where there are slaves, and Octoroon is somebody who legally, by law, is one-eighth black, and therefore is considered not white, and therefore there's all sorts of legal problems and so on. This was, these were the laws at the time. <clears throat> so while it is an interesting historical play, and actually technically a very good melodrama, can we do it at all today? And so this brilliant young playwright, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, came along and wrote An Octoroon, uh, which was an, a commentary on the play in which the playwright appears, the actors who played uh, the original sort of are there, and it moves in and out of the actual text, but at the same time is a commentary on history and contemporary society. And in this moment that I'm talking about, so there is, you know, the key to this play is, you know, the murderer being caught on camera, unknown to him at the time. And a screen, the stage was, was wonderful, uh, kind of semi-abstract, but uh, a screen drops down and there's a projection on it. It seems still at first, but you realize, no, it's a video or it's, it's, it's a movie of a lynching. This was history, and this was so visceral because it caught a murder, but a murder of society, uh, a murder of an entire people. Um, the, the ugly core of America. Um, and it was stunning, and of course it went to interval from that. It had to, there was no way to follow that moment. Uh, but this was also scenography. It is using the visual elements of the theater, using video in an absolutely brilliant way that doesn't say, oh, look, I'm putting video on the stage. No, it was using it to elucidate the plot and to get across a particular emotion, idea, uh, concept. 
uh, within a stage that was a, sometimes fun to wrote cotton balls all over the stage, which is a reference to, of course, the, the, the cotton that was picked by the slaves, but it also made a sort of a wonderful environment for the actors to move through. Uh, there were, and there was a wall that fell over at one point. Uh, anyway, all of this was there, uh, but it, to me it's one of the most startling experiences I or many people I know have had in the theater in, in recent times. And yes, Brandon Jacobs Jenkins wrote this, so he created the environment in which it would occur, but it was, in essence, the scenography uh, that did the designer of the show was Minnie Leon, uh, who's a, a terrific designer. Um, anyway, I, I think we're out of time. Uh, and so those are just sort of random ideas thrown out for you to think about when we go off to have drinks in a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you.